struggled for. Remember, the first one died 20 minutes after the struggle and said, I, I can't. The rat struggled for an hour because it had hope that it might get rescued. And it was doing everything that it could to stay alive. In a sense, you could say that the rat had an optimistic attitude towards life, even though the situation that it was in was dire. Optimists live longer and have a higher quality of life. This is the reiteration of the fact that the way that you think about the world, the way that you think about your life and the future, if it's positive, you're already setting yourself up on a road to a better, more healthy life. And if you're negative, you're already setting yourself up on a much tougher path. I want to illustrate this point even further of attitude in dire situations with the story of Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was a psychiatrist in Vienna, Austria, who was captured and taken to a concentration camp during World War II. Victor, being the psychiatrist in the work camp, started to observe the behaviors of his fellow prisoners. If any of you have ever studied what a concentration camp was like, it was one of the most terrible places that a human being could ever be. That picture there shows how skinny and food deprived people were. Yet Victor started to notice a couple of things about certain individuals. Those who had a hope for something better started to live longer. One of his fellow workers had a bride waiting for him at home, or at least he thought she would still be there. And so he said to himself, I will not die here. I will stay alive and I will get back to her. Another mother had a child who had a genetic disorder and she said, I will stay alive so I can go back to my child. And for Victor, his driving force was, I also have a bride waiting for me back in Vienna. And I also, I want to finish my book. You see, when he got captured, he was in the middle of writing a book. And he said, I will finish this book before I go to my grave. Now, in the concentration camp, he didn't have paper, he didn't have a pencil, but he wrote it all in his mind. He finished his book in his head. He said, I will get out of here, and I will finally put it down on paper. Victor and some of his fellow workers were freed by allies and were sent back to Vienna for his case. But the sad thing is, when he went back to Vienna, he realized that his mother, his father, his relatives, and even his bride had all died in concentration camps. Yet Victor did not lose hope. He finished his book, which is titled Man's Search for Meaning, and he moved forward in life with a new attitude that there has to be something better out there. And that's what drove him. Hope was the determining factor in that concentration camp of whether one had the will to go on or the will to die. If we want to put what we've been saying into a mathematical equation, we can say hope plus intentional action equals positive results. Think in your own life today. Are you lacking any part of this equation? What does your equation look like? If it's different than this, why not give this one a try? Go back a slide, please. While they're working on that, there's an example of two kinds of hope. I've been using the word hope 
But I want to identify to you all today that there are two different types of hope. There is the earthly hope versus the transcendent hope. What is an earthly hope? I'm going to illustrate it to you by telling you the story of Abraham and Lot. Abraham and Lot were relatives, but they both lived in the same area, and both of their camps became too big in order for them to coexist together in the same spot. So looking out over the plain, Abraham decided to give his nephew Lot the choice to go near Sodom or to go near the other part of the side, uh, the other side. It's not as good. It was kind of bare and dry. It would be basically this side of the railroad tracks versus that side of the railroad tracks idea. And so Lot, choosing in his mind, I'm going to go near where the best fertile land is, he chose it. And in his mind, all he was focused on was, I want to become greater, I want to become wealthier. Well, just a little preview of the story, Lot ended up going near the city of Sodom, which had a very bad reputation. And he ended up actually living in Sodom at one point. And he eventually ended up with absolutely nothing because the Lord destroyed Sodom. He lost everything. Lot's mind was focused on material things. Earthly hope. The hope of admiration, wealth, honor, material goods. Abraham, on the other hand, had a transcendent hope. A hope in something bigger than just what's on earth. He had a hope in God. A God who had promised him land and a future generation. The great hope that God gave him was that God was with him and that God was guiding him. This belief in a deity was much bigger than anything on earth because Abraham was able to stand on an absolute truth because truth came outside of himself. He realized that he as a man could not find truth within himself. And without that, there's no hope without truth. But God gave Adam, excuse me, gave Abraham truth, which gave Abraham hope because he could trust that because it was from God, not from man. Two differences. What is your hope today? Is your hope in earthly things, things that can come and go like that? Or is it with God? who is stable, who is not changing, who is truth, who gives a purpose for life, the who, what, when, where, and whys of life, that everything in human history right now is moving towards something and not in a state of chaos. Where does your hope lie? The Bible promises that give us some hope. For I know the plans, and this is God speaking, for I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. This is Peter writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We have been born again into a life full of hope. Why is there hope? Because they can rest on God. They can rest on an absolute truth. An absolute truth gives you hope. Because if there's no absolute truth, what can you hope for if you don't know where everything is going? I want to give you the story of Anna. Anna, on her 23rd birthday, decided to take her own life. You see, for Anna, what's the point of this life? There's no point. Anna didn't believe in God. 
She saw around her only pessimism and apathy. She saw people only concerned about themselves and with material possessions. Anna said, what's the point? Am I just living to die? Life is already hard. There's no reason for me to continue. So I might as well end it right now because there's clearly no truth in this life. It's just a chaotic game. So as she wrote the suicide notes to her family, friends, and even to God, who she didn't really believe in, which is more of a concept, if there is a God, he must be a cruel God, but he has nothing to do with what's going here on earth. The telephone rang. She picked up the phone, and it was a wrong number. But the person on the other end could hear the distress in Anna's voice. And so the other person, who was originally calling a friend to invite them to a Bible study session at their church, decided to extend the invitation to Anna. Anna thinking, you know what, I can't, I couldn't go through with the suicide, I'll give God a shot, decided to go. She started studying and came to the realization that there is hope, a transcendent hope, that there is truth outside of what she sees, that there is a God who has given truth, an absolute truth, and has revealed it to man through the order of nature and its laws, through the Bible and through Jesus Christ. And from that base, Anna realized that her life had meaning. Her life had hope. And Anna gave up any idea of suicide. She became a Christian, and she realized that there's a greater hope that her life is moving towards. What is that greater hope that she's moving towards? The greater hope that Anna was moving towards was that there's a God who gives truth, but there's a God who's also coming back. A God who's coming back to make that which was wrong right again. She realized that the world was not chaotic. It was not in a state of chaos, but rather it was under God's control. And though there were bad things happening, God was still in control. And that gave her hope. See, as this world seems to be crumbling around us, we have the blessed hope. What is the blessed hope? Soon we will see Jesus coming in a cloud with power and great glory. The hope that Anna was looking forward to was that Jesus Christ was going to come again because he said he was going to come again. Because God had given absolute truth. God had made everything. God was in control of everything. And God was going to make right that which was made wrong. And he'd come back to do it. And this is the hope that Anna lived for now. Life had purpose. Life had meaning. Life had hope above material things. Next slide, please. Either way, this hope that Anna has was not something that she made up in her mind. She could see in the world around her things crumbling. She could see pain, hurt, and tears. She could see all of those things that we talked about at the beginning happening on a daily basis. 
But she read in Luke, when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. You see, she chose to look at what was going around, around her. She had the ability to respond. She was not in control of what was happening, but she was in control of her response. And what you hope for will determine what you think about it, which will indicate where your response is. You can't control everything bad, but you can choose how to respond to it. And if you have hope, a higher hope, that is going to affect how you view and how you choose to respond to it, if you believe in that hope. I want to tell you a story about Billy Graham. Go two slides, please. Billy Graham met a man one time who had lost everything in the Great Depression. The man lost his family, his house, his car, and he lost even his own kids. The one thing that he didn't lose was his faith. So as this man was walking down the street one time, he saw a worker working on a piece of stone, cutting it into a triangle. Two more slides, please. As he was cutting into this stone, the man said, what are you doing to the stone? Why are you cutting it into the shape of a triangle? The worker said, well, the thing is, you see that church steeple up there? We're working on it down here so that it will fit in up there. The worker realized that is how God works with us. He's working on us now on earth to fit in in heaven. What does that mean, though? With any piece of art, any marble slab, you realize that it's sometimes certain pieces have to be cut off on the slab in order for a greater picture to come forward. You see, change in your life, whether you view it as good or bad, is sometimes like cutting off those extra pieces of marble slab. Because God, if you believe in the blessed hope, you believe God is molding me into the perfect statue or the perfect piece to fit in in heaven. How many of you have seen Michelangelo's David? That's considered one of the greatest pieces of Renaissance art in human history. Michelangelo's masterpiece. But a greater masterpiece is what God is doing with you right now to prepare you for heaven. It makes Michelangelo's masterpiece look like a child's drawing compared to the beauty of what God is doing in your life today, if you believe in that hope. And if you believe in that hope, you won't give up. You'll realize that in situations, the impossible becomes taking only a little while longer. You'll do the difficult things that you would put off. With unyielding hope, you'll reach your dreams and you'll become a winner because you are striving towards something. Some of you missed the example yesterday of the great Blondon who walked across Niagara Falls multiple times on a tightrope. And they asked the tightrope walker, how do you do it? He said, I keep my eyes fixed on the goal, the end. And where my eyes go, that's where my body usually goes. Your hope affects your attitude, which affects how you think, which affects how you take care of your body. It's all together. And with God's hope, he gives you the direction, not only of what to hope for, but how to think about that hope. 
And by how to think about that hope, how to take care of your body in regards to that hope. So that you can live to the best of your abilities. Next slide, please. Hope, and you will live. Despair, and you will die. It's that simple. What you hope for will affect how you live. And how you live will affect the quality of life that you have on this earth with the one life that you've been given. I choose to give my hope to God, for he's given me hope. I hope you do as well. And if you never have, I implore you to consider it. Because there's a beauty living in light of an absolute truth with a transcendent hope above anything that you can ever think of. Life without Christ is hopeless. But life with Christ is hopeful. I want to close with a prayer. Lord, our prayer is that you will give us positive emotions and strengthen us to fight our battles of life. We know that you will never leave us nor forsake us. You have sustained us in the past. You are with us in the present, and we know you will guide us in the future. With this blessed hope, in Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn is going to be number 456, My Lord and I. Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord, Lord, we are so grateful 
for the timely reminder that Pastor Tony has brought to us. Help us to appreciate these opportunities of your willingness to give us reason to hope. And for those of us today who may not be as hopeful as we should be, we pray that the message he has brought will give us another opportunity to rethink the future, my Lord and I. And then, Lord, as we think about what you have planned for us, a future with good plans, bring us back here tonight at 7 o'clock and help us to renew that hope with wellness in the future. Be with Pastor Tony again as he prepares for the message for tonight and then bring us back to give us reason to hope again is our prayer in Jesus' name.